Now in this lecture video, we're following up on what we did, what we covered in the last lecture video on calculating the covariances and correlations between principal components and the underlying variables from which the principal components are calculated. And remember that we do that for the purpose of trying to attach meaning to those principal components to try to interpret what those principal components are measuring. Uh, interpreting uh, the interpretation of principal components is not guaranteed by the process itself. Uh, interpretation is not built into uh, the uh, problem that principal components is a solution to. However, sometimes we can uh, interpret the uh, principal components, and the way that we do that, again, is primarily to look to see how a given principal component is correlated with uh, each of the input variables, uh, the original variables, uh, uh, that are used in performing the principal component analysis. And so we're going to follow up uh, that example, or that uh, lecture, by uh, reanalyzing or doing some additional analyses uh, in the context of a principal component analysis using the data from Table 1.1 in Brian Manley's text, uh, one of our recommended resources. And in particular, we're going to uh, take another look at the Sparrow data. Uh, we saw this in a previous lecture video, and we've done a principal component analysis on this data. Um, and we, in, the, in, that, uh, in that lecture video, when we looked at this example, we uh, wrote uh, a SAS program, a short SAS program, to analyze the data. And so now what we're going to do is continue on. Uh, we're going to add some uh, additional features to that analysis that allow us to uh, uh, try to interpret uh, one or more of the principal components um, that are associated with this data, computed from the data. And we're going to uh, perform this analysis in this situation, in this uh, lecture video, using SAS Enterprise Guide. Now, Enterprise Guide is a, uh, uh, a point, has a point and click interface. Uh, so it's a, it's a program that sits on top of SAS, and you use the mouse to point and click to build a, what's called a process flow diagram. Uh, this region here in uh, the SAS Enterprise Guide uh, interface, this is called the process flow uh, section of the uh, program. And uh, we build the analysis that we want to perform here in a process flow. And, uh, so I want to show you, uh, you know, this as an additional way of doing analysis using SAS. Uh, many of my students uh, in my classes, and in particular in uh, this uh, multivariate class, uh, really uh, like uh, Enterprise Guide for doing analysis. Because again, you don't have to worry about programming. Uh, you can uh, you know, use uh, the mouse and, and select the analyses that you want to perform. And then uh, what Enterprise Guide does is it actually uh, writes uh, the program for you based on the selections that you've made. So the first thing we need to do is we need to uh, uh, select a data set uh, that we're going to analyze. And again, we are analyzing uh, the data from Table 1.1. And so I'm going to, I've got that data set um, in a location, in a, in a folder on my computer. And uh, I have already pointed uh, to that folder with Enterprise Guide by following uh, the dialog menu. And so I'm just going to select that SAS data set. <clears throat> and remember, you can download this SAS data set uh, from uh, my course website and also from uh, Moodle. Uh, I posted that data set there. So you can see here that we've opened uh, the data set here in Enterprise Guide. And so you can see a listing of the uh, data. We have the variables across the top, and then we have uh, the observations in the rows. We have 49 observations. Right? You'll remember that from uh, the previous lecture video when we looked at this. Now, we can specify the analysis that we want to do uh, either by selecting the appropriate options from this menu that I'm pointing to that is uh, provided across the top uh, and above the data set that's shown here, or we can select the analyses from the menus up here at the top. 
And uh, so what I want to do is show you, I'm going to minimize the, this display of the data set uh, by uh, clicking on this, uh, this uh, close button right here. And so what you see here is our process flow page, process flow uh, diagram page. And we have, uh, there's a link to that data set on uh, the process flow page. And uh, we could double click that and uh, bring back up the data set. And uh, and we can close it back down. Uh, you can select the analyses, build the process flow um, using you know, either this view or by looking at the data set in this way. Um, I'm going to show you what, what it looks like uh, by looking at the process flow. And you can see that my computer is taking a, a quite a long time to load that data back up. Typically, that would not be the case. Uh, but I've got a lot, of, a lot of software, a lot of programs running right now. Uh, but anyway, so let's take a look. Um, yeah, OK, it came back up. We close that back down. So uh, I want to uh, perform a principal component analysis using SAS Enterprise Guide. And so what we need to do first is we need to make sure that the data set is highlighted. Notice that if we click out here in the process flow panel, that that's going to deselect uh, anything that is selected or had been previously selected um, in that panel. <clears throat> so again, we need to make sure that the data set is selected uh, because the uh, <clears throat> Enterprise Guide needs to know which data set the analyses that you're selecting apply to. Okay, so <clears throat> now that that is selected, I'm going to go up to my Tasks uh, menu option and select that. And you can see here that there are several options available to us. <clears throat> we can open a data set. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe we can process a data set. Uh, <clears throat> and you can do fairly sophisticated things uh, using this uh, uh, submenu. Uh, we're not, we don't need to uh, do any further processing, uh, database processing of our data set. And so we'll skip that. But <clears throat> we're going to be performing uh, a multivariate analysis. And in particular, we're going to perform the principal component analysis. So all we have to do is select this, uh, this option, and it's going to uh, bring up a wizard uh, that we can, uh, or a panel here that we can use to specify uh, the, the uh, essentials needed to do this analysis. <clears throat> now notice over here in the far left-hand panel, there are uh, several different uh, aspects of the analysis that we can uh, modify and control. And we have to, some of these are required. For example, we have to uh, specify the data uh, that we're going to be using for the analysis. And other uh, of these uh, components are uh, optional. Now, we are going to perform a principal component analysis on the five measurement variables. And so I'm going to uh, highlight those. I can either uh, press the uh, right arrow key uh, to uh, move them over to, the, uh, to one of these sections, or I can just drag the highlight and drag those variables over uh, in the, into the appropriate uh, variable category. So these are analysis variables, and so I've uh, dragged them over here. And uh, in this, uh, for this data set, for this analysis, we don't have any variables, so we don't have, we don't have any partial variables, we're not, we don't have any analyses, or oh, I'm sorry, variables we're going to group the analysis by, and so forth. So this is all we need to do um, in order to perform the analysis. Now, we could you know, use the group variable as uh, uh, one of these two, but we're not going to do that in this case. Um, and so now, uh, let's see, let's uh, select the second um, feature or aspect of the analysis, the analysis uh, page or panel. And we need to, well, we, we can select uh, how we want to do the analysis. Do we want to perform the analysis on the uh, standardized variables, which is the default, or do we want to have, analyze the original variable? 
Now, remember that uh, we talked about this in a previous lecture. Um, many times it's going to be appropriate to perform an analysis, a PCA, on the standardized data. Um, and this is especially true if uh, the, the variables, the response variables, the analysis variables, are measured uh, with different units. Now, that's not to say that you would, you would always uh, <clears throat> perform an analysis using the standardized data when the units are different, but in, in, in many, and if not most cases, that would be the case. Um, another situation where you uh, would perhaps want to uh, use standardized data instead of the original variables is if, even if uh, the variables are measured with the same units, if uh, there's uh, if the variances uh, and therefore the standard deviations of the original variables are uh, much different, different if there are big differences in magnitude in those uh, measures of variability from one variable to another, then you may uh, want to uh, analyze the uh, standardized variables instead of the original variables. Now, the way that uh, you would analyze the standardized variables, the way that that is described in many books and uh, in Enterprise Guide here, is that uh, you are analyzing uh, the correlation matrix. Okay, so when uh, so that's and that's the default here in Enterprise Guide, and it's the default in SAS. If you want to analyze the uh, original data using the PCA instead of the core, instead of the standardized data, then um, you have to tell it you have to tell SAS to specifically uh, do that. So, I believe in our analysis in the uh, previous example, in the previous lecture video, uh, we analyzed the uh, <clears throat> unstandardized data. We analyzed the original variables, the raw uh, data without standardizing it. And that is accomplished by uh, selecting covariances uh, for the uh, type of analysis, for the type of PCA. Now, how many principal components do we want to be computed? When we have five input variables, five uh, analysis variables, there are five principal components that can be computed. And so uh, we'll just go ahead and compute all five in this case. Uh, then we can move down to, uh, well, let me just back up a second here. Uh, this field right here, this is the prefix for naming the principal components. Now, the default is PRIN, P-R-I-N. And since we're computing five principal components, the variable names for those principal components will be PRIN1, PRIN2, PRIN3, PRIN4, PRIN5. If because of the, you know, if, if we wanted to give the uh, uh, variable names for the principal components uh, names that had more, uh, more meaning, we could change the, uh, the prefix for naming those principal components. But I'm going to uh, leave uh, this as it is, all right? And then I'm going to look at the kind of plots that I can produce. And uh, we do want to uh, perform a, or, or create a screen plot. And so we'll check this box. Uh, I also want to create a scatter plot matrix of the principal component scores. Uh, we did that when we did the analysis in uh, SAS. And uh, let's see here. The other plot that I'm going to create is a uh, pattern component plot. And for the results, I do want to create a table, a data set, containing uh, the original data and the principal component scores because I'm going to follow up uh, the principal component analysis with some additional analysis to show you some things. And uh, let's see here, I don't need, I really don't need anything else on that page. And then for the titling, uh, this is uh, optional. If you want to change this, there's really no need uh, right now. And then properties, um, there are some things we could do here by selecting the edit button, but that's, uh, we don't need to do that. And so if we now click run, then this is going to run the analysis. Notice that it has included a uh, PCA on the uh, process uh, flow diagram page. All right, and so here we have the results 
uh, for the PCO. And you'll recognize uh, this output. This, is this, this output looks the same as it did when we ran the analysis, uh, when we performed the principal component analysis in SAS. And again, it's no surprise that it looks the same because this is a SAS product and Enterprise Guide is, is a point-and-click interface to uh, the SAS software. And so you'll see here, uh, we've got 49 observations. Uh, we've got five uh, analysis variables, X1 to X5. And again, we've got uh, some basic univariate statistics for those variables, uh, the mean and the standard deviation of the, each of those five variables. And then, because we uh, told Enterprise Guide that we wanted to do the analysis on the covariance matrix, which is uh, an equivalent way of telling it that we wanted to analyze the raw data, the, the unstandardized data, then it gives us the covariance matrix uh, for the data. So, again, this is a bivariate uh, summary of the uh, five variables, giving us the pairwise uh, covariances uh, between each pair of uh, variables. And then we have uh, the uh, table of eigenvalues. Uh, in other words, these are the characteristic roots of the estimated covariance matrix. And uh, then we have um, the difference from uh, one eigenvalue or one characteristic root to another. We have the uh, proportion of the total variability that is accounted for by that particular uh, principal component. All right. And so, for example, you remember that the total variability uh, of the data is equal to the sum of the variances, all right, which is, would be the sum of the values in this, uh, the diagonal values in this covariance matrix. And uh, luckily, we don't have to calculate that ourselves. SAS calculates that for us. And so the total variability associated with X1 through X5 is 40.9694. Now, the first or the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix is 35.3258, approximately. And so that is, uh, that represents 86.22% of the total variability of the data uh, for this data set. And so if we were, and then you can also see over here uh, the cumulative uh, proportions. So if we look at uh, the second eigenvalue, that's 4.622, okay, that is the variance of the second principal component. And uh, that particular principal component accounts for 11.28% of the total variability uh, in the data, and, and so forth. And you see here that uh, once we get past the second principal component, you know, looking at the third, fourth, and fifth principal components, then those principal components really do not uh, account for much of the total variability in the data set. And so uh, we, would, we could reduce the dimensionality of this problem from a dimension of five down to a dimension of two, or maybe even one. Now, remember that if we uh, use the uh, criterion uh, such as uh, uh, select the number of principal components that account for at least, let's say, 80% of the variability in the original variables, if that was the criterion, then we would only need to use one principal component. So we would be reducing the dimensionality of the problem from five down to one, which is a great reduction. On the other hand, and we can also use, uh, we can look at the screen plot to determine how many principal components to use. And so, for example, with this situation, what, we, what you're always looking for is uh, a well-defined elbow where the uh, where the plot uh, really starts to flatten out. And you see here that uh, the elbow here is at uh, the third principal component. And then what we do is we back up one. And so based on the screen plot, again, we could uh, decide to use two principal components. And if we use two principal components, then that is account that would be accounting for 97.51% of the total variability in the data set. And because we can still plot uh, two principal components, you know, on, on a page, uh, I would opt for using two principal components, okay, because that's accounting for most of the variability, and we can still uh, plot those scores on a two-dimensional page if we need to. Now, 
we also look at the scatter plot matrix of the principal component scores in the previous example. And uh, again, down the diagonal of the scatter plot matrix, these are the histograms uh, for the individual principal components. And one of the things we're looking for here are uh, would be uh, evidence of uh, non-normality. Um, many of the procedures, multivariate procedures that we'll uh, use subsequent to a PCA, uh, have a built-in assumption of multivariate normality. That implies that uh, the uh, principal components would be multivariate normal, and then that that would imply that the, that the individual principal components were univariate normal. And so if we see evidence of non-normality, either in uh, these histograms or in the scatter plots, then uh, that would be evidence that the uh, underlying assumption of uh, multi normality for the original data uh, is, uh, is violated. Uh, we're also looking uh, for, to see if we have more than one population. And so again, when we look at this first histogram, this is a bimodal uh, histogram, and so that may indicate uh, two different groups within our data, which makes perfect sense because we had uh, two uh, groups of birds, of those that lived and those that uh, did not survive. So it, it could be, I'm not saying that that's the case here, but it could be that this bimodality is a result of uh, whether or not uh, the birds survive. <clears throat> Okay, so this is, you know, we had looked at this uh, previously. We're not going to take any more time on this plot. But what I wanted to do was to uh, now look at uh, what's, what are called the component pattern plots. Now, in the last lecture video, we looked at how to calculate covariances and then ultimately the correlations between each principal component and the original variable. And uh, we, we use those correlations to help us try to interpret uh, what the principal components represent, uh, what they are measuring. The principal components are derived variables. They are derived from the original uh, measured variables. And if we can interpret what those principal components represent, then it can help us uh, in uh, you know, applied problems and draw conclusions. And so the information uh, regarding the correlation, the correlations between the principal components and the original variables are represented uh, graphically using the component pattern plot. Now, let me just say in passing uh, that uh, this is a, an example of a type of biplot. You'll remember that when we gave our overview of the course, uh, one of the topics was biplot. And there are several different uh, types of biplots, different ways of uh, constructing biplots. But one of the main features of biplots is that they are plots that combine information about the original variables with uh, information about the uh, uh, principal components themselves. And these component pattern plots uh, do that same thing. They incorporate information about the principal components with information about the original variables. And in particular, uh, these plots are giving us uh, graphically the correlations uh, between the principal components and the original variables. And so let's look at this first component pattern plot. Now notice that on the horizontal axis, uh, we've got values for principal component one. And recall that uh, based on the table above, uh, You'll remember that uh, the first principal component accounts for 86.22% of the total variability in the data. The vertical axis is, uh, in this plot, corresponds to principal component 2, which accounts for 11.28% uh, of the total variability in the five variables in the data set. <clears throat> now, we, we have a plot here, and the question is, uh, what are these? What do these plot points represent? Notice that we have one, two, three, four, five plot points, and they're labeled x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. These <coughs> plot points uh, represent each of the individual response variables that uh, we have in our in our data set. 
the coordinates of these plot points correspond to the correlations between uh, each variable, each original variable, and the two uh, principal components represented by the axes. And so, for example, let's look at the point x1. You can see here that the, uh, the uh, horizontal, the, the first coordinate uh, for that point is a little bit more, <clears throat> it's approximately 0.8, maybe a little bit more, you know, looking at this, uh, looking at the graph. And the second coordinate uh, would correspond to uh, a value of about 0.5. The first coordinate for the point x1 is the correlation between x1 and the first principal component. The second coordinate is the uh, correlation between x1 and the second principal component. Likewise, the coordinates for x2 correspond to the correlations between x2 and each of principal component 1 and principal component 2. So you see here that the correlation between x2 and the first principal component, y1, is uh, looks to be greater than uh, 0.9, and the correlation between x2 and uh, uh, principal component 2 is negative, uh, and it's uh, about negative 0.2, maybe uh, negative 0.25 approximately. Um, on the other hand here, let's see, you, you, uh, the, correlate, or the, correlate, the, the coordinates of uh, point x3 correspond to the uh, correlations between x3 and uh, principal component 1 and principal component 2. You can see that uh, it's fairly strongly correlated with principal component 1, but it's very, very weakly correlated with principal component 2. Uh, <clears throat> the point x4, the coordinates correspond to the uh, correlations between x4 and each of principal component 1 and principal component 2. Uh, uh, X4 is fairly strongly positively correlated with principal component 1, uh, but it's really not uh, linearly, linearly related. It's not correlated with uh, principal component 2. And then finally, uh, the coordinates of X5 give the uh, cor uh, correlations between X5 and each of principal component 1 and 2. All right, and so you can see here that uh, X5 is moderately uh, uh, correlated with uh, principal component one, uh, but very only very weakly correlated with principal component two. And so we can use a plot like this to begin to uh, uh, interpret what a principal component is measuring. So, for example, if we look at, if we consider principal component one and what it's uh, what it's measuring. What we're going to do is look at uh, the five variables that are used in computing principal component one. We're going to look at the correlations uh, between each of these variables with principal component one, and then try to interpret based on uh, the uh, sign of the correlations as well as the magnitude of the correlations. And you can see here that because all of these points are to the right of the origin, that would indicate that all five variables are positively correlated uh, with principal component one, some strongly and some moderately. And so we could interpret principal component one um, as uh, really as because these are because x1 through x5 are all uh, some form of measurements of the birds. Um, and in particular, if we go back and look at uh, what these uh, uh, variables represented, these are lengths essentially of different. Uh, aspects of the bird, then we can interpret the first principal component as being a measure of the overall size of the bird. As each of these, as any of these uh, variables increases, then uh, the principal, because of the positive correlation between these variables and principal component one, uh, the first principal component would tend to increase as well. If these variables tend to uh, decrease, or, or if these variables decrease, then uh, principal component one would also tend to decrease. Uh, and, and so because these uh, correlations are all positive, um, we can think of PC1, or uh, principal component one, uh, Y1, 
as uh, being uh, some sort of an average or, or you know, a weighted sum of uh, those lengths. And so it's a measure of the overall size of the bird. Now, to interpret principal component two, uh, we could again focus on this graph, but now instead of looking along the vertical axis, we look, uh, I'm sorry, uh, instead of looking at the horizontal axis, we look at the vertical axis. Now, when we look uh, at these points with respect to the vertical axis, we see here that uh, x3 and x4 are very close to uh, zero in that dimension, and really x5 is, uh, you know, fairly close to uh, uh, is zero as well. I mean, it's, it's a little bit bigger. It's about 0.2. Um, we would probably, in, in interpreting principal component two, I would be comfortable ignoring x3 and x4 and focusing primarily on x1 and uh, perhaps x5 and x2. And because x2 is negative, uh, we could think of uh, the principal component two um, as being uh, measuring some kind of a, a difference or a comparison of x1 and x2, uh, and or maybe we might fill x5 in as well, so a comparison of x1 with x5, a, a comparison between x2 and uh, x1 and x5 combined. Let's put it that way. Now, what is uh, x2 and what is x5? What is it? So x1 is the total length of the bird. Um, x2 is the hour extent, the distance between the tips of the wings fully extended. And so, uh, with principal component two is positively correlated with the total length of the bird and negatively correlated with the hour extent, the distance between the tips of the wings fully extended. So what values of uh, X1 and X2 would uh, tend to make uh, principal component two large? Well, if the total length of the bird was large, but if the hour extent was small. So large values of uh, Y2, the second principal component, uh, correspond to birds that are longer in length but have uh, a shorter hour extent. On the other hand, uh, small values of uh, y, uh, Y2, the second principal component, correspond to birds that are, have a shorter total length but have greater wingspan. And so we can, we could think of uh, uh, the second principal component as being uh, a measurement of uh, you know, making that kind of comparison, the length uh, compared with, the length of the bird compared with the wingspan of the bird. Now, we could continue on and look at the subsequent plots. Uh, for example, um, in this plot, this component pattern plot, we still have component one on the horizontal axis, and now we have x3, I'm sorry, principal component three on the vertical axis. And if we were going to interpret, uh, try to interpret principal component three, uh, we could ignore x1 and x2 because those correlations are very, very small. And we could focus uh, on x5 and uh, maybe throw in x3 and x4. Okay, so again, uh, x5 is the length of the keel, um, and then uh, let's see here, x3 and x4, x4 was the, uh, the, larger, the next larger correlation of magnitude, that's the length of the humerus, and then x3 was uh, length of the deep uh, head. But uh, by far, the, the, the third principal component is uh, much more highly correlated with the length of the keel than any of these other variables. And so we might uh, think of X, uh, I'm sorry, principal component three as providing, uh, really focusing on the length of the keel of the bird. But now how many principal components do we need to focus on? How many do we need to focus on trying to interpret? Well, again, going back up to uh, the screen plot, or the cumulative proportion of uh, variability accounted for by these uh, principal components, uh, we would uh, only need to uh, really focus on one or at most two of the principal components. And so it would probably be sufficient to just focus on this first component pattern plot and uh, try to interpret principal component one and principal component two. 
And so we've done that. Again, principal component one, I would, I would interpret principal component one as a measure of the overall size of the group. And I would uh, interpret principal component two as uh, being a comparison uh, between the total length of the bird and the wingspan of the bird. The larger the values of principal component two, uh, the longer, that would indicate a longer uh, bird uh, with a shorter wingspan. Uh, for birds with smaller values of principal component two, then um, that would correspond to birds that are shorter and have greater wingspan. Now we can scroll down here and we can see that we have several of these principal component pattern plots. Uh, one thing that we did not do, uh, that, that we did not include in, um, the, the, these, uh, in this analysis, and in particular in the plots, were uh, uh, some additional scatter plots uh, of the observations based on the principal component scores. Now we do have a uh, scatter plot matrix that has these, but it may be beneficial to uh, include uh, some additional plots. And so what we could do is we could, um, let's see here, let me open this up, and we could uh, either create a new task and include those additional plots, or we could modify the existing task and uh, include uh, the uh, uh, plots that we want as part of this analysis. And so and you'll see what I did there. I clicked Modify Task. And that's going to allow us to go in here and change some things. And what I want to do is under the uh, uh, Plots uh, panel, I want to create a scatter plot of the principal component scores. <clears throat> and I do not want to show ellipses or anything like that. And so I can now run uh, this analysis. And Enterprise Guides ask us, do we want to uh, replace the results from the previous run with this modified set of instructions? If we say uh, no, uh, then it's going to create a new path in our uh, uh, diagram and our set of analyses. Um, if we say yes, then we're just going to replace the previous results. And I'm going to select yes there. And uh, so then, let's see here, let's go up to the results. And uh, so now after the uh, component pattern plots, uh, we have scatter plots of the principal component scores, pairwise scatter plots. Now, the reason I wanted to look at this is because, uh, remember, we have now attached meaning uh, to the principal components, uh, in particular, the first two principal components. And so, while we have, uh, well, we'll look at these later, but uh, I want to focus on this one first. Remember that uh, principal component one is, uh, is a measure of the overall size, the overall length of the bird. And so, uh, and these plot points correspond to uh, birds. We have uh, 49 birds uh, that are represented in this uh, plot. And so birds that are over here to the right are birds that have uh, overall greater greater size. Uh, birds over here to the left are, are the smaller birds. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we look at, if we think about the, uh, the uh, points in the vertical direction, then uh, points that are uh, higher in this plot have larger values of principal component two, and so those would be um, <clears throat> birds that have that tend to be longer but have shorter wingspans. Uh, on the other hand, uh, birds that are plotted down here, uh, lower values of the principal component two, are birds that have a shorter length and a longer wingspan. And so uh, that is uh, something, so being able to interpret what these principal components uh, are uh, helps us to uh, get a better understanding of what uh, uh, this plot, uh, is, the information that this plot contains. Now, one other thing that we can use uh, these uh, uh, scatter, plot, scatter plots of the principal component scores to do is to look for outliers. And so if we see um, groups of birds that are distinct, or if we see separate groups of birds, and that 
uh, well, let me back up a second. We can look for, we can use the principal component uh, scatter plots to look for groups of observations, but we can also use them to look for um, outliers. And so here uh, we have uh, a group of birds that looks to be somewhat separate from this other larger group. Uh, now, I'm not saying that those are necessarily outliers or problematic, but you know, it may be interesting to look at birds 25, 30, and 37 to see what might make them different or stand out stand apart from the other birds. Now, notice that um, these three birds have small values of principal component one. So overall, these would be uh, three of the smaller birds that would appear. And uh, also, their values for principal component two are fairly close to zero. All right? So that, you know, going back into the original data and looking at those measurements uh, may be uh, uh, interesting to look at given this kind of information. We can also look at uh, scatter plots of principal component 1 versus principal component 3. And again, we might look for uh, groups or outliers. And if we can see these same three birds uh, over here to the left, which is not surprising because we still have component 1 on the horizontal axis. Um, the, uh, here, this is a plot of uh, uh, component 2 versus principal component 3. And uh, we do have a few birds that are uh, somewhat uh, separated from the other groups of birds. So, for example, 34, 41, perhaps. Um, and looking at these uh, other plots, you can see here 31 is standing out in this uh, uh, plot of component 2 versus component 4. And here we again have 34 standing out, 31 is standing out, and also um, in this plot, bird 8 is standing out. So uh, <clears throat> you can see here that we can use these plots to uh, look for groups of uh, observations, groups of birds, uh, as well as looking for uh, potential outliers. Okay, I, well, I want to show you something else. Um, let me close down this uh, display panel here. So we, here we have our process flow <clears throat> diagram. It starts off at our data table, and then we proceed uh, we perform a principal component analysis. And uh, here we have the results of that principal component analysis. All right, and uh, let me see, I'm not sure why that error message came up. Uh, that's uh, unusual. Typically, um, I like that wouldn't happen. But anyway, so what I want to do is uh, to keep moving forward here. Um, I want to look at this uh, data set that we've created as output from the PCA. You'll remember that uh, one of the things we did, let me bring this analysis back up, uh, is, let me see here, so the, the uh, Results. Well, there's a problem here. I'm not sure what's going on with that. But let's bring up this data set. Okay. Something is going on here. Let me see if I can get this resolved. Well, this is unusual. I've never seen this happen before. But what we're going to do is I'm going to delete those that analysis. I'm going to redo it. And so let me, this won't take uh, but a second, which is one of the nice things about um, having a, a point click interface. So I want to do a principal component analysis. And again, I'm going to uh, select my five variables. If this time I'll pull, uh, press the right arrow key. I want to move them to my analysis variables. I'm going to do the analysis on the covariances. Um, and the plots, again, I want the screw plot, uh, a scatter plot matrix. I'll take, uh, 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 let's see here, I want the uh, scatter plot of the principal component scores, and then uh, the component pattern plots. And we do want to uh, create a data table containing the original data and the component scores. And so I'll run this. Hopefully, we won't get an error message. Um, but. Uh, Okay, so here we have the results. 
And what I want to do now is um, focus on this uh, data set that we created as output from the principal component analysis. And so you'll see here that we have the original variables, x1 through x5. But now we also have the values of the principal component scores. Now, it is these values that are used in constructing these plots. All right? Now, <clears throat> remember that, let me go back in here. Remember that in these component pattern plots, the coordinates of uh, these points are the correlations between that point and the two uh, principal components represented by the coordinate axis. So these plots give us uh, graphical information about the correlations uh, between uh, each of the variables and the principal components. Now, in a previous lecture, we saw how to compute uh, these correlations. We saw how to do it by hand. All right? And those computations, those formulas, are based on uh, the theory. All right. Now, I want to show you another way to get those correlations. We can get those correlations, the correlation between each of the principal components and the original variables, by just doing a correlation analysis on this data that was output from the PCA. Because the output from that, that principal component analysis gives us the values of the principal component scores for each observation. All right, and so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do a correlation analysis. And um, I think what I'm going to I'm going to, uh, so before we uh, select the analysis from the task menu up here, uh, I'm going to show you how to do it uh, with the data view open. And so we, with the data view open, we want to analyze this data set. And in particular, we want to perform a multivariate analysis. All right? And uh, more specifically, I want to calculate correlations. I want to do a correlation analysis uh, where I'm uh, and computing the, the empirical correlations between each of the principal components and uh, the original variables. And so let's put uh, the first five principal components, well, the all five principal components, as the analysis variables. And let's compute, and let's put the original variables in the correlate with uh, variable section. And we can select various options. Um, I'll tell it to compute the covariances as well as the correlations. Uh, let's see here. We want, <clears throat> let's create scatter plots for each pair. So we'll, we'll look at scatter plots uh, for each uh, principal component with the uh, each uh, variable input uh, specifically. And let's see here. Then I think that that's all we need. So let's just go ahead and do this analysis. You can see down here that it's running. And so you can see here that we have uh, a, co a covariance matrix. All right. Uh, well, it's a table that contains covariances. Okay, this is not a covariance matrix in the same sense that we will be using it <clears throat> in the notes. Uh, this table has, has covariances between uh, each of the principal components and the underlying original variables. So, for example, the covariance between uh, principal component 1 and total length x1 is 18.952. Uh, the Covariance between principal component 2 and x3 is 0.155, and so forth. What we're interested in is the table of correlations. And so here we have uh, the correlations. In, in each column, we've got the correlations between uh, the given uh, principal component and the five underlying variables. And so you can see here the principal component 1 
it is highly positively correlated with X1. Well, in fact, all of these, the correlation between uh, <coughs> principal component 1 and X1 is 0.8726. The principal component between, I'm sorry, the correlation between principal component 1 and X2 is 0.972. The correlation between uh, principal component 1 and X3 is 0.722, and so forth. And so these are the numerical values for the correlations between each principal component and uh, the uh, original variables. And so we could use uh, these values uh, in trying to interpret the principal components uh, in lieu of uh, the graphs. But I think the graphs are easier to use, uh, which is uh, you know, why SAS is producing them. So uh, <clears throat> these correlation values uh, provide the input to the graphing facility that SAS is using to create uh, those uh, component, uh, those uh, uh, plots that have uh, the points that correspond to correlations between each variable and the principal components. Okay. And then down here we have uh, scatter plots of principal components versus each of the original variables. And so again, this is additional information on the, on, uh, the strength of the linear relationship between each principal component and uh, each individual variable, right? The, the, the more tightly these uh, points are around uh, a, uh, a line that we would fit through here, the higher the correlation. And so we can see here, uh, again, you know, it gives us the uh, uh, values, the actual numerical values of, of the correlations. <clears throat> Now, if you, if you were to uh, go back and take, uh, go back and look at <clears throat> the characteristic groups, the eigenvalues, and the uh, values from the covariance matrix, all right, for the original variables. If you were to use the formulas that we provided in the last lecture to compute the covariances and the correlations, then you would get exactly uh, what we got empirically using that correlation analysis that we just looked at. Okay, so we've seen now how to uh, perform principal component analysis using a programming SAS, which they call SAS System Pro. You have uh, seen how to perform the principal component analysis using SAS Enterprise Guide, which is this point and click interface that sits on top of SAS. And we have seen um, how to uh, begin to interpret uh, what principal components are measuring by looking at, uh, by evaluating their correlations with, with each of the uh, underlying variables. And uh, we've done this um, by looking at these component pattern blocks. So what I would recommend is that uh, you try to do these analyses with SAS Enterprise Guide. Um, if you don't have SAS on your computer, um, you, it's very easy to get, uh, especially if you're on campus. All you have to do uh, is to go over to our departmental office, talk to Miss Sylvia, and um, if you if you can, what you can do is take a check over. I believe it's twenty-five dollars, and you can. Uh, uh, borrow the installation media for SAS to put it on your computer. Now, SAS does require Windows to run, and you can get that information from her. But uh, anyway, that is uh, uh, one approach. I, I believe that the Enterprise Guide is also um, available through uh, the uh, virtual lab at LSU. So give, uh, give this a try. I think you'll really like Enterprise Guide. And we're going to continue on with the next topic in uh, uh, principal component analysis in the next lecture video.